Further discussion on House Committee Substitute House Joint Resolution 117, Lady from St. Louis County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to speak on the House Joint Resolution. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We just heard about work requirements in other welfare reform provisions. We, in the richest country in the world, partly because of this welfare reform that took place, we have children in poverty. In the richest country in the world, we have children who don't have enough food to eat every day. We need to provide that safety net, which we are eroding with this bill. Now, this bill isn't about providing food for children. It's about providing health care, which is the reason that we have Medicaid. The reason for Medicaid is not to ensure, ensure people work. It's not to raise or change what they do every day. It's to make sure people are healthy. And what happens when people can't go to the doctor when they're healthy? They get sick and they cost the system more money and they put more people into poverty. When people can't get health care, they cost the state more money. They become what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle like to call the most needy. Medicaid expansion is going to prevent people from becoming the most needy and, need, and needing those more expensive services. Medicaid expansion will ultimately save our state money and provide a better quality of life for its people. Now, this bill does a couple things. Um, one thing it does is it makes Medicaid expansion subject to appropriation. We all know, given the history of this body, that the legislature would not appropriate for Medicaid expansion if this bill were to pass. If we, if we don't appropriate for Medicaid expansion, we run into a crisis with federal law. Our contract with the federal government says we will provide Medicaid expansion. But if we don't appropriate for it, if we on our own don't pay for the Medicaid expansion population, then we will be running afoul of our contract with the federal government and we will put millions of federal dollars at risk for what my colleagues call the most needy. I, asked, I reached out to the Department of Social Services and asked if they have contacted CMS about this language. And they said, DSS has not reached out to CMS regarding HJR 117, as it is a hypothetical at, at this point in time. We don't know what the federal government will do if we pass this language. And nobody has asked the federal government what will happen if we pass this language. I am afraid we will put our whole Medicaid program at risk if we do this. The other thing this bill does is it imposes work requirements, which are not in place in any other state. Work requirements were implemented in Arkansas, and over just a few months, thousands of people lost their Medicaid because of the work requirement reporting that was instituted. And it was because many people didn't know of the reporting requirements or couldn't comply. It was shown that most of the people who lost their Medicaid were working. Most people were working, but they lost their Medicaid because they couldn't comply with the reporting requirements. DSS struggles right now. We have call centers that have hour-long wait times on average. There was one month last year where food stamps had more than a three-hour wait time. People who have to work 80 hours a week can't afford, or a month can't, don't have the time to spend three hours on hold and then get hung up on trying to get food and food stamps. We, need, we don't have a DSS department 
that is capable of implementing this in a way that would make it easy for people to comply. Our Department of Social Services and our computer systems, our outdated computer systems, would be relied on to implement this. And they're not capable of doing this. People will lose their Medicaid, people who my colleagues call the most needy, will lose their Medicaid because they can't comply or because they can't prove that they're, that they're exempt from the requirements. This will be devastating for our state. So I encourage the body to vote no on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion, gentleman from Jefferson. May inquire the lady from St. Louis County. Lady from St. Louis County, do you yield? I yield. Proceed. Good morning still. I'll be morning. quick. Uh, you said something about the DSS workers are having a hard time. The phone lines are very long and drawn out because it's a three hour wait. And uh, What's the main reason for that? Um, it's staffing. Staffing? But it's also the computer system. I don't think it's all a computer system. All I've heard was, I've heard the excuse. I mean, we have IT issues all across the state, but, so we but what you just said phone was, system but everyone a, who keeps talking about is we have a staffing issue. Maybe those people would be, maybe we should offer employment opportunities with the state of Missouri so that then they'd have health care benefits and a job to help some of, the, still some of those three hour waits. That's just a, that might be a solution. So we should offer these jobs to Medicaid recipients? Yeah, I mean, I, anybody I between be... 19 to 65, which the bill states any able-bodied person between 19 and 65 years old, and then there's a whole slew of exemptions. I would for be the sick fully to... in favor of offering every Medicaid recipient y You know what, they job. have the opportunity However, to apply all across the state of Missouri for multiple jobs that are open. All they have to do is go online and apply for a job with do the state of Missouri. We have do we hundreds have over of jobs, open. jobs opening. Do we have over 700,000 jobs open right now? Over some, no, not 700,000, but I'm also pretty sure not all 700,000 people uh, actually fit in the 19 okay. to 65 so category. But I can tell I, you I, in the state I, of Missouri, we probably have 700,000 700, jobs because we're at like a three points, what, I haven't seen the latest numbers on unemployment. But everywhere I go, every person, I, every, every trade, every person I've heard sits there and says the same thing over and over and over again. I can't get help. I need help. I need staffing. I can't get anybody to show up to work. I can't get anybody to help. I think we have plenty of jobs in the state of Missouri if people want one. And, and I think the gentleman's bill clearly defines that those people who are most vulnerable aren't allowed or don't have to meet those work requirements. 20 hours a week is not too much to ask anybody to do their fair share and to put a little effort and skin in the game the to get the Medicare recipients. The fact that it's not too much to ask is not the point here. The point oh, that, is, lady, that is the point. That, they that's would the be point. required to That is exactly it. the point. They would be required to prove it, and they would not be able to. They, they can't they prove that they have a job. They would not be able to prove they, they that they're prove working. They're going to they would school. not be able they to prove that they're going to school. They can't prove that they're going through a substance program, lady. Their that, bosses that's, those give are them those 20 hours a week. That, what if their boss gives them 19 hours a week? What if they get pneumonia one week? Well, it says 80 hours work? a month, so you have the ability now, to pick up more hours one week. What if they can't work that? What if they don't get offered those full 20 hours every week? What if they get 75 hours, and that's the maximum somebody will offer them? Because well, part-time jobs Well, lady, don't you know what? Here, here's the thing, lady. Here's the thing. You get a second job. Up. When you have people like myself who are working three extra part-time jobs on top of this, I don't want to hear excuses about, well, I, I couldn't get it. I could only get 75 hours instead of 80. Part-time jobs are set up to... You, um, they yeah. have the ability to go get multiple part-time jobs if they want. We want they them to go get full-time jobs. We want them to go get benefits. Their schedules and Asking their kids somebody schedules. to work to get a benefit is no. not... No, it order. is not acceptable. That, and it will yeah, not, it is acceptable it, to ask people to actually put some skin in the game and actually be a productive member of society. That's what we're arguing about today. If you're going to get no. public tax dollars, what we're doing then you here, need that. we need to help you. We are making people prove it every single month 
that they're working 80 hours. That, and what's wrong with actually making people prove that they are working and trying if, to better themselves they, and get if off they the system? Get that job every month if they get offered 75 hours instead of 80 hours one month they lose their health care do we want people hours to lose week. their health care because they are short five hours, hours a, we're a talking month. about 20 hours a week if you need to there's other opportunities do we want people to lose their health care because they are short no um, i want them to go get hours. a full-time job and be productive members of society are all I, parents I able to, to have, have full-time jobs and take care of, and get child care? State, we have lady. child care de deserts in this state, gentlemen. We have their people are caregivers for young children, for school-aged children, and we and don't lady, have child care for them. How do they do it back in the fifties and sixties and seventies? How do all these other had people? Two have, we had one oh, working two parent, parent well, families that's down a with different rabbit hole. Married. I think you're hitting the nail on the head right there. So, lady, I appreciate the inquiry. I think we're done arguing on this one. We all know where we're going to vote on this. And there Gentlemen from Pem Scott, please do not intercede the line of debate. Thank you for the inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.